Kanavi Medical is a developer, manufacturer, and marketer of medical imaging systems to guide common, minimally invasive cardiovascular procedures. We've got CEO Tom Luby here to discuss the company's recent 510K submission to the FDA for its latest NovaCite hybrid imaging system. Please remember that this video, this interview is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. My name is Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. Tom, great to see you and congrats on the FDA submission. Thank you, Martin. It's good to talk to you again. All right. Um, can you maybe just start at the top? What exactly is the the uh, the imaging system you do, and what is the use case for it? Not too yeah. deep, but just a quick high high level overview on it. Absolutely. I think your intro was was uh, spot on. But just to kind of break that down, we help to guide one of the most common uh, procedures uh, in interventional cardiology. Uh, there are about four million of these procedures that are done each day, uh, uh, each year. Um, and what you said is hybrid. We have a Novacite hybrid system. So what does hybrid mean? We've taken the two foundational imaging techniques. One is ultrasound and the other one is optical imaging. And we put them together in the same catheter. And we're doing that and, and supplying it to hospitals right around the same price point as if they were paying for I, uh, ultrasound only or OCT optical only. Uh, to give them more value. And the reason why we do this is because with ultrasound and optical imaging in the same catheter, you remove all the blind spots that are inherent in one or the other one of those uh, foundational modalities. Each modality isn't necessarily better or worse than the other. They just catch different things. So having both of them, you get, I don't know, twice as much information, but you get more information having both of them. 100%. Ultrasound does a great job at uh, sizing the inside of the blood vessel, thus uh, inferring a size of a stent. And OCT or optical imaging does like the micro work a lot better. Is that stent expanded properly within uh, the lumen? Uh, is there any dissections that I have to concern myself about? I'll say that, that what it practically happens, though, is that when a physician starts with ultrasound in a case, they, they have to finish with ultrasound. They're not going to spend twice the money on two different catheters and twice the time booting uh, those systems up. If they start with OCT or optical imaging, they will start and finish with optical imaging. So our breakthrough is to be able to provide it right around the same cost. Uh, there's, there's really little training involved because by and large doctors know how to operate these systems. So we're giving them the best of both modalities for right around the same uh, price. And there's no additional time to use our, our device either. All right. You have an, an existing device that this hybrid system in the marketplace already, and this FDA submission is for your next generation device. The world of FDA submissions and approval is pretty Byzantine and most people don't really get how it works. Can you explain what you're doing here with the, this new submission? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two broad paths to have your device uh, cleared by the FDA. One is you know, a de novo or, or new application for something that is really quite maybe groundbreaking. We are not that path, which is good for us. It, it's lucky for us. This is a 510K pathway. It's, it's the simpler of the two. And the 510K pathway de determined, uh, is, is uh, dependent on a predicate device or predicate devices. So years ago, we had our first generation cleared by referencing two other devices, okay? Now that we are cleared on the marketplace, it's actually even more straightforward for us in the next generation because we are using our own currently cleared product as the predicate. Um, so that simplifies hopefully the review for the, for the agency. Uh, but in addition to that, we have filed a um, pre-submission uh, pre -submission application back in June, and we received feedback from the FDA in August, had a meeting with them, and by and large, I think we understand what is on their minds, right? They're pretty familiar with the inherent um, underlying technologies already. Uh, they had some questions that I think we've we've answered uh, for them. Uh, but then that process goes into sort of like the technical screening. They'll take a couple of weeks to determine is everything there that they wanted to have there, all right? And then the clock, you know, the clock uh, that is inclusive of a clock that's about a 90-day total review. But that clock can stop you know, if they have additional questions. And typically we we kind of budget for about a five to six month total review. And yet we remain optimistic that it can happen even sooner than that, but we don't know. 
So in the processes you, you submit it, they've got 90 days to respond. One of the responses could be, hey, we need some more information on this or that. And they sort of uh, throw the ball back to you and then you provide that information and then the time, the 90 day starts clicking again. That's correct. Okay. Now, uh, some companies who maybe didn't have the, 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 the foresight to um, you know, do a pre-sub or have a preliminary discussion with the FDA, sometimes the FDA can take maybe as much of that 90 days as possible and then send you know, a request for, for new information at the very end of it. Then the company has about, I think, 180 days to reply. So you can see where that time starts to add up. The reason why we did the pre-sub, certainly we're advantaged by having our own product as, as a predicate. I really do believe that that helps the agency understand our application much quicker. Yeah, I guess they at least would have looked at it before and given it some thought and then hopefully, uh, okay. Yeah. So in an ideal world, you could get your approval within 90 days. You know, again, I think we were pretty well prepared because of these just recent conversations we've had with them that we think we know what their data requests were and we think we've supplied it already. But, yeah. you know, their their job is similar to our job. It's it's to help keep patients safe and to make sure the products are effective. That's the same charter that we have here at Kanavi Medical, too. So whatever yeah. questions they have to help satisfy their curiosity about safety and effect, uh, efficacy, we're going to answer for them. And what's so much better about your ne current new generation device versus the old one? What does it do better? So many things. So the in, the underlying value proposition, which I described, which is giving them both ultrasound and optical for the various strengths there. But, you know, it's not just about image quality. But, so we, we wanted to go out for the best in class uh, ultrasound and the best depth of penetration optical uh, at the same time. So in a hybrid catheter for the coronary um, space. And I think that we did that. Underneath the surface of that, we we knew that in order for broader adoption, we would be we want to be preferred as the easiest to use, the most straightforward. So there are certain hardware um, features that we've we've uh, designed into this product. I'll give you an example of one of them. A lot of times with competing products, um, the the staff in the cath lab have to put plastic bags over certain electrical components that are pretty hefty and move them around within the sterile field, right? If you're going to have a, you know, a patient on the bed, you need to take care of the sterility of certain um, tools that you've got there. Well, that's cumbersome and the staff does not like to do that. So we've lengthened our catheter so that this electrical device is outside of the sterile field and it just removes another step uh, for, for the staff. Um, so that, I think that that's going to be quite uh, attractive to to uh, doctors and, and to their technicians. We have also infused into this a lot of AI, AI that we're kind of advantaged uh, to uh, to supply because we do have those two rich data streams, uh, the IVIS and the OCT that cross talk uh, with each other. So that's just going to get that engine's just going to get stronger and stronger. And again, because we are co-registered hybrid imaging, we're the only ones in the world that can do that. All right. And the AI, it helps like it highlights something that should be of concern or just uh, and, and lets the doctor then say, oh, yeah, let's, let's sort of zoom in on this uh, portion. That's exactly right. We call it tissue characterization. Um, there's lumen detection to help doctors determine the size of that lumen. The, the doctor can certainly adjust the, the you know, what the, the computer tells them to. Um, you know, eventually, probably what we'll do is give it the doctor an option to merge the two images together. We get a lot of questions about whether that's possible. It's certainly possible. But right doctors, now, they're side by side, and you kind of look at through each sort of lens. Yeah, my experience is that, you know, if you t make too many leaps with the technology in one generation, then folks are saying, wait a second, how much of this is the computer doing versus how much of this am I doing, right? Yeah. So we give them both uh, raw videos side by side. But if you make uh, a measurement on one side, it populates on the other. If you notice a calcium on one side, you can confirm, deny, or, or clarify what you see on the other side. But I think that there will be a time when the technology is so trusted that uh, some doctors will just want to see one, one view of it, right? Yeah. Uh, so that will be on the roadmap later on. Uh, but there is really good uh, AI tools. And like, as I mentioned, the hardware upgrades, there's some bedside controls that, you know, they don't seem like high tech to you and I, 
but it's really at the point of attack for a doctor. It's how they interface with the tool, right? Yeah. And the feedback that we've received from uh, the doctors through three uh, trials that we conducted over the summer is that these bedside controls, the fact that the patient interface modules outside of the sterile field, all that stuff seems to be pretty attractive to these doctors that use the product. And just circling back a little bit, you were saying the image sensors for each one are better now. And the so the OCT is sort of best in class for OCT. So it could go up against any single OCT camera. And the IVIS is the same thing. And now you've just got the two best in class combined together. Yeah. So just to give you some numbers, uh, our first generation on the ultrasound side was 40 megahertz, roughly 40 megahertz. Yeah. There's a product in the market that's a 20 megahertz uh, product, so lower resolution, if you can kind of understand that. There is sort of an upper bound um, that we, we try to achieve, which is 60 megahertz. And the reason why it's an upper bound is because with ultrasound, you sacrifice depth of penetration when you get to higher resolution. So we think that we found a really nice sweet spot that allows us to say that we've got a pretty darn good high definition uh, IVUS. On the OCT side, uh, it's always been really highly resolute. What we did is work hard to extend the depth of penetration, and we feel, feel like we are at the top echelon of the depth of penetration in OCT as well. So to do that in a hybrid device when you've embedded the imagers into each other is a very complicated thing that I'm just so proud of my team uh, for, for finding out a way to do. And so it's normally with things, there are a lot of trade-offs. But it sounds like you've sort of eliminated trade-offs. You you get the one imaging, you get the other imaging, you get best-in-class imaging, and you do it can do the whole thing uh, faster. Is is that a fair way to look at it? I, I certainly think I, I am a big uh, believer. Uh, you know that that is the case, and I, it just turns out that when you look at uh, even this academic paper that we sometimes have shown from last September. Uh, these are the doctors basically reviewing the available technologies to guide uh, percutaneous coronary interventions, which is our main, uh, you know, uh, application here. Um, they say that IVIS is good, but not great, the ultrasound one. They say that OCT is good, but not great because it, it has these trade-offs. When you put them together, it is the, the most competent uh, imaging platform, according to this paper. Uh, and that compares against some of these other up and coming technologies that are maybe 10, 15 years down the line. They still believe that IVIS and OCT is the complete uh, product. So if your audience is curious about that paper, I can direct them to a link that, uh, you know, demonstrates that without me saying it. It's somebody else uh, basically saying that combined IVIS OCT is the real winner here. Yeah. And it, it provides statistically improved outcomes for the patients. It's not just cool, but it actually saves lives, so to speak. Yeah. So the ca the category itself of intravascular imaging has received a lot of investment to prove this out, right? Whether it is standalone IVIS or standalone OCT, it does demonstrate against just angiography alone, a 46% reduction in post-procedure death. Okay. That's a, a massive amount of, of uh, you know, save, life savings. You know, sometimes companies get founded for 10% improvement of something, right? This is a pretty extraordinary uh, finding. Um, stent thrombosis, you know, blood clots that occur after a procedure can be reduced by 52% if you use IVIS or OCT uh, to guide the procedure. So what we've done is on that foundation of clinical evidence with warming guidelines, you know, in the United States and now in Europe uh, to class 1A, uh, you know, growing reimbursement coverage and things like this. What we've done is we've taken those two modalities that are now gold plated in terms of the clinical evidence, and we've done one better. Now, once we get cleared, we will do studies to prove, you know, prove that out that having both uh, advantages you even further. All right. One final, it's not a question, it's a comment. Last year, looking at your deck, you were uh, forecasting you did get your FDA submission in in Q3, and you got it in in Q3, which is uh, pretty remarkable, especially a year out hitting your guidelines. So congratulations on, on that. That's impressive. Yeah, it was very important for us to do that um, as a very simple or simplified um, you know, business plan that we've got right now. 
you know, there are a, key, a few key milestones in submitting to the FDA, certainly the biggest one that we had. Uh, next, we'll get clearance in early 2026, uh, we, we assume, and then uh, we'll be off to the races to start working with our uh, clinical partners to use the product in the field. With, let's say, early, how much from FDA approval until launching the product in the marketplace? Yeah, so we're not giving uh, you know precise guidance on when we'll we'll do the first case. Okay, but we'll be ready. We'll be ready to go, and and we've got some excited users out there that want to get their hands on it. Excellent, Tom. Thank you very much. Any final words before we wrap it up? No, but just if your um, audience wants to know anything more, go to Kanavi.com, or if they want to get a link to this academic paper that I mentioned, we can certainly send them the link. I'll throw that link in the uh, notes at the bottom of the video as well so people can uh, see it there. So awesome. thank you very much. Tom, have thank a great you, day and talk to you again soon.